So I'm joined today by Emily Elizabeth Anderson, and I'm so excited to have her on the program. Tell me a little bit about your background, how you got involved in this stay at home daughter movement. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I'm so excited to be able to share a bit of my story. Um, I got involved through Bill Gothard's cult, uh, IBLP or the Institute in basic life principles. And he had a subsect of that cult called ATI or the advanced training Institute. And that's really what my family was involved in. And that's where I learned about the stay at home daughter movement and the principles that are taught within that movement. Sure. So for someone that doesn't know anything about this, you know, they've maybe heard this term, a stay at home daughter, maybe they think it's something like a stay at home mom. How would you explain to them what this is and what it means? Mm -hmm. It's typically taught in very patriarchal circles and being a stay at home daughter is we are taught preparation for being a stay-at-home mom. And so it's um, the basic principles that are taught are that girls need to be under the protection of male headship at all times. So when they are single, that means being under the protection of their father. And when they're married, that means being under the protection of their husband. And a lot of wedding ceremonies that I have witnessed of people that follow this movement, there is an actual transfer of authority section that happens within the marriage ceremony where the father, they'll have this little speech and the father will literally take his daughter's hand and transfer it over to her husband as a transfer of authority. And so in order to stay under the authority or protection of a male figure, that means that girls raised in the stay-at-home daughter movement are not allowed to live on their own without having male headship over them. So you see these young women, if they don't get married when they're young, possibly they could be in their 30s. I've seen even into their early 40s where they are still as a single woman living under their parents' roof. And um, part of the stay-at-home daughter movement is that a woman should not earn income for herself. Or if she does, it's in a very limited capacity with only a few professions that are allowed. So these women that are staying under the protection of their father, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to live with your parents, but it can be very harmful when you teach these women that they can't get a higher education, they can't create a career for themselves, they can't really create any kind of independence. Their entire life, they are told, you are in training to be a stay-at-home mom. So that means learning household responsibilities, learning how to cook, how to clean, how to be the dutiful homemaker, and how to raise children. And a lot of these daughters are raised in homes with a lot of siblings and younger siblings. So they begin to practice motherhood as a young girl. And as a teenager, they begin to practice by mothering their siblings because they're told they're in training for mothering their own children in the future. Okay. So yes, that, that all seems to be familiar with what I've found, you know, from interviewing different people. Now you mentioned at the beginning, uh, Bill Gothard and the ATI movement. How would you see that? Was that the driving force behind the stay at home daughter movement or was this movement also in other groups and other leaders? Um, or would you say that was kind of the main person propelling it along? There were other organizations that propelled the stay-at-home daughter movement. It was very common in independent fundamentalist Baptist churches. Um, Also, another cult leader, Doug Phillips, who ran the organization Vision Forum. Um, He had some loose connections to Bill Gothard, and he also really was a big proponent of the stay-at-home daughter movement. And Vision Forum would produce documentaries and other material teaching the benefits of being a stay-at-home daughter. Okay, okay. Now, how old were you when you first heard 
that, you know, you should not pursue a career. You should get married, have children. That was kind of your number one goal. Was this something you were taught? You know, are we talking before teenager or teenage years? When did, when were you first exposed to this teaching? Well, I was raised in a pretty conservative Christian home and my parents were both school teachers at a very conservative Christian, um, private school when, before they had children. And then after they had children, my mom became a stay at home mom and my dad moved into, um, construction. And so I, from first through fourth grade was raised in that public or in that private Christian school. And then in fifth grade, when I was 11, 12 years old is when we officially joined ATI. And so while I was raised in Baptist churches and was raised around a lot of um, pretty fundamentalist patriarchal views, pretty much from birth, it's not until that we really became ingrained in ATI when I was 11 or 12 that I really started to become indoctrinated in the more extremist views of patriarchy and fundamentalism. Sure. So what were some of the scriptures or ideas that they used to, um, justify the, you know, these beliefs? Cause obviously these seem countercultural with what most of America is doing in our culture. So did they have like one specific verse or, you know, something culturally, maybe in the old Testament, what was, what was the driving force behind it? It's definitely a lot of cultural references, um, there would be stories that they would pull out of the old Testament where a, they could make a case that a daughter was outside and not underneath the authority of her father and some kind of harm happened to her, perhaps a rape, an attack, something like that. And they said, well, that's because she left the authority of her father. So those kinds of stories were twisted to preach a certain kind of narrative that really put a lot of fear into uh, my heart. And of course, any scripture that referenced male headship over a home, female submission, those were preached quite a bit to try to create a biblical case for this hierarchy within the family. Mm -hmm. Sure. So walk me through, you know, you're reaching teenage years. Are there decisions that you're still able to make on your own? Like, are you allowed to have a cell phone? Do you have a driver's license? Um, Can you communicate with friends? Or I know I've spoken to some people where it was very much like they couldn't go to the grocery store without a man, whether that be her brother or her father, um, what kind of level of, you know, outside interaction were you allowed to have? Mm -hmm. Well, now as an adult, I try to look back and discern between what was my own choice made out of fear and what was actually something I was allowed or not allowed to do. Mm -hmm. And I would say there was, there weren't very many hard, fast rules in my home as far as you're not allowed to do X, Y, Z, but rather when you are indoctrinated daily with a belief system that is primarily fueled by fear, I made my own choices. And I would even say that when I would talk to others that were outside the movement, that this is my choice. I'm not forced to do this. This is my choice. This is my own personal conviction. This is what I want to do. Right. And so you know, it's not really, it wasn't really my choice because I was being indoctrinated, but at the same time, it's not like I had a desire to do certain things. And my parents were laying down the rules that I wasn't allowed to. Um, but because I lived in this fear and because I would say I was very emotionally stunted, uh, where I could have been allowed to do things legally, I held back. For instance, I didn't get my driver's license until I was I think just about 24. Wow. And yeah, and it's not because my mother said you can't get a driver's license. In fact, toward the end, like when I was in my early 20s, she was pushing <laughs> me like, like, go get one. <laughs> right. I'm tired of driving you around. <laughs> but I was just so emotionally stunned. And I just had these fears of like, oh, I'm not, I'm not grown up enough. Like, can you I remember when I turned 15 talking to my older sister who was not in raised in the movement? And 
I'm like, can you believe I'm legally allowed to get my permit? Can you imagine me driving? I'm, I'm, I'm still a child. I shouldn't be driving. Wow, yeah. And I had that mindset. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that is. So how would you say this movement affect your, affected your relationship with your parents? Like, was there a lot of pushback from you, you know, with your parents or was it more of like, you're saying you believed it so much yourself that you all are kind of in alignment? Mm -hmm. Well, I did not have a good relationship with my father. Um, A lot of my story is that he was very abusive to me growing up. And so we were a little different than the average ATI family in that we didn't have a strong patriarchal presence. Interesting. Um, My dad just did his own thing. He he was, he didn't really follow the doctrine. He professed to be a Christian, but just went to church and that was about it. And then he was a workaholic. So it really came down to just my mother and I, and we were together all day long as I homeschooled and we would go to these conferences where we would receive teaching from Bill Gothard and we would be watching the documentaries together. We would be having all the discussions on the importance of, you know, purity and, 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 and all these things and courtship. And so it was really just between my mom and I, and, um, I, I, we were definitely in agreement. I would say we were, we were two peas in a pod together on that and had discussions all the time about how good, you know, this is the way that we should be living and how good and godly it was. So there was definitely no tension between teenager and parent there. That's interesting. That is really different than a lot of people I've interviewed, um, where you yourself were just, you know, bought in. Um, when did that start breaking down where you realized, okay, this is maybe this isn't quite right. This doesn't seem like it's making sense. Mm -hmm. Well, when I was 18 years old, I went up to ATI's headquarters in Chicago and was personally counseled by Bill Gothard. And during that time, I was sexually groomed and targeted by him. And when I turned about, about a year later, when I turned 19, I came across a website by accident from uh, adults that had left the ATI movement. And they were starting, they had written many articles that explained the dangers of the movement and how this was not theologically sound. And there were a lot of survivor stories of other women that had been targeted by Bill. And it was through that website that I realized I had been targeted. And then within a couple of years, I joined a lawsuit with 18 other victims. Um, We all had allegations surrounding some some amount of sexual misconduct. And um, so at that point, I believe I was 24 when I joined that lawsuit. And when I joined, Mm -hmm. I joined in November and uh, I thought if I'm going to do this, I probably need some professional counseling. And so I made my first counseling appointment a month later on December 15th of 2015. And that's what I call my freedom day. Yeah. That was the day that I reached out for help for the first time. And the first time I shared a bit of my story with a professional and they were right. able to tell me, this is not normal. This is right. not safe. You've been abused. Um, and so that was the point where I began to deconstruct. And my deconstruction really was very intense for the first few years. And then ever since then, I've continued to learn and grow more and speak out more about the dangers of the patriarchal movement. Sure. So. 24. So it's about the time you got your driver's license. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. In fact, I got it like a month before that. Oh, um, really? Yeah. Appointment because I knew that I needed to get counseling and I, I I felt silly having my mom drive me to counseling. So I got my driver's license. (laughs) Was your mom supportive of this move when you decided to, you know, join the lawsuit and go to professional counseling? Initially she was not supportive of the lawsuit. Um, I think she was still struggling to reconcile with the truth herself. And um, that actually created quite a bit of tension for a couple of years as I began to grow and to deconstruct and to walk away from some of the things that I had been raised in. Um, But over time, 
I saw my mother start to grow as well. And we began to find um, new things to build a relationship on. And I'm, I'm happy to say my relationship has been built back up again, but it was definitely strenuous there. I would say that's when the tensions started between like the parent and adult (laughs) child was when I did start to question some of the things that I had been taught. And it took both of us having to do some individual growing um, for us to be able to get to a better place. Now, did you move out at 24 or did you wait until longer? I waited longer. Yeah. Yeah, Because I was still afraid, even as I was going through counseling, my counselor kept saying like, you are an independent woman, Emily, you need a job. You need to be independent. You need to be living on your own. And, um, it took a lot of encouragement and a bit of pushing out of the nest from my counselor of like, you've got to do this before I finally had the courage to do so. And, um, I think I was, I think I was 26 when you moved out, when I finally moved out. Sure. Yeah. And did you get a job then or was the job? I, I had had a job prior to that for about a year. Mm-hmm. And I started, I started cleaning houses Yeah, because what better job as a stay at home daughter than to clean houses. It's so what can I you explain this? Someone, Cause this made me think of this, like <clears throat> there from different people I've talked to, there's like approved jobs and then not approved jobs. Like some of the ones I've yes. heard is piano teaching, cleaning houses, babysitting, you know, Etsy shop. Those would be approved then you've mm-hmm. got your unapproved jobs, like basically working at a retail store or nurse in a hospital or you know, something out in right. the world. Can you explain the distinction and why it's okay to do that, but not okay to go do something else? Right. So I think what is an approved career versus not is based on your exposure to the world mm-hmm. and how closely it aligns with your duties as a house a wife. Okay. So a retail job, for instance, would be exposing you to the world. You'd be listening to worldly music over the speakers. You'd be interacting with worldly people sure. on a daily basis. You could be influenced by worldly trends and that's not okay. Right. Um, plus that's just, that has no connection to being a housewife right. versus okay. teaching piano lessons in your home you're within your home. That's okay. Um, having an Etsy shop or like a little in-home bakery where you're selling jams and muffins, like all that is very homemaker esque, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's allowed. You can make money doing homemaking things is the idea. Um, I never really saw house cleaning as a, as a commonly accepted form of employment. Um, maybe it was done on a very small scale, like where a daughter could be hired just to clean her pastor's home, something like that. Sure. Very controlled where it's somebody within the church, you know, it's another Christian family that you're not going to be exposed to a worldly family, that sort of thing. But just going out and cleaning random people's homes, that would not be allowed, at least not, or that would not be um, recommended in the circles that I grew up in. Um, Yeah. Um, babysitting of course was very common because that is practicing child rearing. Um, there would be two instances that I know where it would be acceptable for a young woman to leave her father's home without being married. And that would be if she were to go and live with a missionary family and do missions work with them, because she would be under the headship and authority of the male missionary, right. Or similarly to be a live in nanny for a family that is somewhere within the ministry. So I know like a lot of pastors, even, um, Doug Phillips, um, had his own live in nanny, which that's a terrible story. I think I I read something about that. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, didn't end well because he ended up targeting his live in nanny, but something like that, where you've got a family that's in full-time ministry, the mom is overwhelmed because she has a dozen kids and they're traveling (laughs) all over the place. That would be acceptable for a single woman to go and actually live with them, be under his headship and be employed that way. Okay. Okay. So you getting the job as a housekeeper, that was outside of what normally would have been acceptable. 
Yes. So you're but kind I of chose that. Out. I chose that because I had so many limited skills. So high school, college, um, was it different because you were a female, which we yeah. talked about, but right. Did you feel like you were prepared with your, cause you mentioned you had like limited skills was college completely off limits, like no college. Right. Cause I know some, some people I've spoken with, they said, well, as long as it was a, a, a college, you know, like Bill Gothard had a college, I believe, um, as long as it was something like that, like you're going to a Christian college, it was okay. But right. there was others who were like, no women should not, they don't need to be educated beyond high school. Right. So as I continued through high school, um, general secular college was certainly discouraged. Sure. Even large four-year Christian colleges, something like Bob Jones University or Pensacola Christian College, those were even discouraged. Now, it's hard to tell exactly what factors into all of this because another large part of my story is that I was diagnosed with a very severe case of Crohn's disease when I was 13. So as a teenager, I was living with a life-threatening chronic illness and my schooling was greatly affected because I was just constantly in and out of hospitals and sometimes would be in a hospital for two months at a time. And of course my mom wasn't making me do schoolwork when I was in the hospital, (laughs) right? Really have a normal school, uh, structure. I just did. I caught up on homeschooling when I was, you know, feeling a little bit better and not in the hospital. And so even then we just gave up on certain subjects. I think, I think I attempted to learn geometry like for three years in a row. And we always ended up quitting a few months into it because I could, right. I was always too sick to finish it. <laughs> so There's that aspect. So I know a lot of the influence I had of not going to college was also because I had a chronic illness Mm -hmm. and I was so sick during my teenage years that I did require pretty much around the clock care. And my mother was my full-time caretaker. So I think part of the idea of not going away, even to a Christian university was, I was told it was a waste of money that if I was just going to get married and become a homemaker one day, that you know, there's no point putting me in all of that debt sure, or a useless degree that I'm, I'm never going to use. So there was that, um, and, and that it was a waste of money for sure. And the idea that you're living out of the protection of the home, you're living in a dormitory or even just rooming with a co- couple of the girls that makes you, um, prey to possible attacks. I mean, I I remember being taught that, you know, it's not good to go live in a dormitory because that's how girls get raped, you know, because you're not living with the protection of a man. So that played into it. But then of course there was the logistics of how do I, if I need full-time caretaking for my health, how do I manage living, um, on my own, you know, right. and being able to manage school on my own like that. Um, so part of it was belief and then part of it was just health. Practically. Logistics. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. All that to say, we did look at, I believe they were called accelerated distant learning programs. Oh, I remember yeah. hearing about these. Yeah. So you can take CLEP tests, Mm -hmm. um, which are like run by the state. Right. So you can study for something you like crash course study on a subject like algebra, and then you can take the algebra club test and you get the equivalent college credits. Right. This was heavily promoted in the homeschooling community because this allowed you to basically self take college at home using club tests And it was way cheaper because you were self-studying on your Mm -hmm. own and then you only pay like for a $50 CLEP test. Um, And then you could maybe transfer those into some kind of college that is just, just zeroing in on, you know, a specific occupation. Right. Um, For instance, if, if maybe you wanted a bachelor's in performing arts for, for, or for music. If you wanted to, you know, get, get a bachelor's degree to be able to teach piano, then you could clep your way through all your gen eds 
Right. And, so you're not, yeah. Yeah. And then go to maybe a local community college just to get the few credits you need to actually get your bachelor's so you can be mm-hmm. a piano teacher or whatnot. So we, we pursued that. Um, and in fact, it was for music because I was extremely talented. Right. Um, as a teenager, I played both the harp and piano and I was pretty obsessed. I did a lot of competitions, especially for piano. At one point I was practicing piano upwards of six hours a day. Wow. And it was, yeah. it was my passion. I absolutely adored it. And so we were looking at, um, continuing education for that. And that included looking at club tests and then some kind of either community college where I could take advanced piano education, or, um, we were looking at Bill Gothard's college program, (laughs) which was called Verity, the Verity Institute, Oh um, yes, where Verity was nothing more than them guiding you through club tests. Any of the ATI campuses, any kind of interaction between male and female was not permitted. So whether that was at what they call training centers, which were usually various old, old hotels where they would hold conferences and they sure. would have young, they would have like teenagers and young adults come up there to serve in the ministry for so many months or years. And so whether it was a training center or it was headquarters or it was Verity, you couldn't have converse, like male and female students couldn't have conversations together. They certainly, there was no unchaperoned time with each other. So I would say the vow of singleness was just more so that students weren't creating any kind of romantic inclination like with each other. So, you know, if you're not allowed to talk to the opposite sex or be unchaperoned, how were you supposed to go about finding a spouse? Uh, So that goes along with courtship movement (laughs) and the basic rules in courtship movement uh, are that first of all, the male initiates And so a young man is supposed, ideally, he's supposed to spot a young woman from the distance and observe her from the distance. So that way he gets to understand her true nature versus if he were to just approach her, maybe she would like get all infatuated and want to like put on a front. So the idea was get to know each other. If you have interest, keep it secret. Okay. But get to know each other in a, in a group setting so you can like try to observe their true nature and character. And then if the young man is further interested, then he approaches the girl's father. At okay. that point, the father and the young man have pretty in-depth discussions. And I have seen, I've heard stories where a father would develop a deep relationship and have like weekly grilling sessions with a young man for up to two years. Wow. where he's discipling this young man. He is essentially dating. It's the guy that, or it's the, the father that's dating the guy essentially yeah. and trying to decide if this young man is, is worthy of his daughter. And if so, and he feels safe with that, then he will give the young man permission to start a courtship. And at that point, the father goes to the daughter, says this young man's interested in you. I think he's a good guy. And so at that point, they begin an intentional relationship where they are examining each other for marriage potential and having uh, chaperoned interactions with each other. Families will go out to dinner with each other. Families will invite each other to homes or whatnot. Okay. Um, And so it's always still like this group, this like family dating group interaction. And um, if they really start to get serious, some families might allow the young couple to start texting each other, usually with the parents involved in a group chat. So like all text messages are still supervised. Um, Any kind of phone calls are usually supervised, anything like that. And as they continue to get to know each other and start to feel like, yes, you know, this person is suitable for marriage, then they would enter an engagement still keeping all the chaperone rules, right. no physical touch, no physical contact whatsoever. And then when they get married, that's when they're allowed to create an emotional connection. I remember specifically being taught, not only are you not allowed to have any kind of physical intimacy and where I'm not just talking sex, I'm talking, right. some couples couldn't hold hands. 
certainly you couldn't kiss before you were married. So not only were you not supposed to make any kind of physical connection and intimacy, you are not supposed to create or build any emotional intimacy okay. because the theory was the more emotional intimacy you built, the more tempted you are to become physically intimate. And that was not okay. So it was really sad because it set up a lot of couples for failure because they were essentially marrying a stranger. Right. Right. Interesting. Okay. So let's shift gears a little bit. Um, the stay at home daughter movement, how do you feel like it, um, affected you emotionally? Like for life, you know, you, you start driving life outside of your parents, life on your own. Did you feel pretty confident? Like you could go into life and just cruise or was it like difficult for you? It was terrifying for sure. And I think, um, right around the time I began counseling, um, I think when I turned 25 is when I went out shopping for clothes for the very first time on my own without getting input from my mother. It's not like I, it's not like I had to have her approval on my clothing, but I, I desired her input and I wanted to make sure she was okay with it. And so that was the first time I just went shopping on my own and bought clothes without consulting her. I still like bought clothes. She would have approved of, (laughs) (laughs) but you were doing it by yourself (laughs) myself. And I remember thinking, this is like so strange. And I remember the very first time, I think I pulled through a I, going grocery shopping on my own was a new experience. Um, buying, buying food on my own that, that, you know, we hadn't discussed the grocery list together. And just, if I was craving a certain thing, just like buying that with, without just on my own, you know, making, right. making my own choices and going through a, um, drive through restaurant for the first time felt kind of scandalous. Cause it's like, <laughs> I'm spending money on my own yeah, <laughs> for exactly. myself, not for anybody else. I'm not enjoying a meal with someone else. So that was a little scandalous. So it was definitely um, a very frightening experience as I began to gain independence and um, trying to support myself financially was extremely difficult, especially because sure. my monthly costs are astronomically higher having a chronic illness. I really need the income of like three full-time yeah. jobs to be able to cover all of that. So, um, I did receive some financial help from people that, um, were watching my story and that had gotten out of the system years sure. before and knew what it was like. And so I received a lot of, um, gracious gifts that were able to help me and, and get me on my feet. Um, but the, um, I ended up meeting my husband online. Yeah. Um, I started online dating um, about a year into therapy. Uh, again, that was a big push from my yeah. counselor. And I remember the way he <laughs> described it. He said, Emily, even the finest piece of goods doesn't sell if it's stuck in the warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> it's he's so like, true. If you don't put yourself out there. Yeah. So he's like, your Prince Charming is not just going to show up at your doorstep. You've got to put yourself out there. Right. And so I signed up for an online dating website. It was a Christian one. Right. Um, and, and dabbled in that for a little bit, had a few short-term long distance relationships. And then I, uh, was connected with my husband two months before I moved out of my mother's home. So we started okay. our long Yeah. And he was 1500 miles away from me. So we started our long distance relationship while I was still living at my mother's house. And I remember like the day I told him I'm moving out in two weeks, I just went inside a lease for an apartment. And so at the, the, I, and I only had my lease for one year and it just so happens that the, just a couple of weeks after my first year lease ended is when my husband and I got married. Um, and I moved in with him. So I only had a year of independence on my own. And during that time, I was completely involved with a new romantic relationship. So while I was, while it was scary to step out on my own, um, I was very distracted by my husband. We'll put it that way. Right. Right. (laughs) Probably not a bad distraction, you know? Right. Right. It was good. It was good. I didn't feel so lonely for sure. Right. So 
what were, I know everyone that I speak to, it seems like they had a very specific dress standard. Like what were you allowed to wear? Was it really strict or, you know, a little more lenient? Um, we were not as, as strict as some families. I know we never wore head coverings. I know a lot of girls did that. Um, but it was pretty much everything else we did. Um, so no pants, no pants, only dresses or skirts that had to be below the knee when you sat down. Mm -hmm. So your knees had to be covered. Um, mostly loose clothing. You couldn't have anything that accentuated your curves. And as a curvier woman, that was hard (laughs) to (laughs) find clothing that didn't make me look like I was in a potato sack. Um, and, um, no low cup top. What I'm wearing today would definitely not be acceptable because you have to have, here's my collarbone. Then you have to have your, your dress, your shirt go up to your collarbone. Um, so that was not a, uh, yeah, no neck showing, um, shoulders had to be covered, no spaghetti straps or anything like that. Um, if you had to check your tops when, if you bent over and make sure there was no gaping. And if there was, even if the neckline was real high, depending on the fabric, it could still gape a little bit. So in that case, you had to wear an undershirt underneath that would hug against your skin. So when you bent over, then you weren't showing any more skin. Um, yeah, that's, that's most of them I can think of. No high heels. I could do high heels that were like a little petite heel that was maybe just an inch and a half high, just a little tiny thing. Um, and no words on clothing. So you can have a t-shirt that had a phrase on the front of it that was called an eye trap in ETI, oh. meaning that somebody's eyes would be going toward the words and reading it, which essentially meant, you know, a guy would be looking at your breasts and that's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that one about the yeah. words. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And just in general, things that looked trendy and worldly because our whole focus was sure. not looking like the world. So even just a I just, I remember not even wearing t-shirts that they didn't even have words on it, but just like normal t-shirts because that's something worldly that's what you would wear with jeans you know that's what the youth group kids would wear and that wouldn't be okay what about how did this inner intersect with recreational activities like were you guys allowed to go swimming did you go you know i'm thinking of snowboarding because that's what we do around here or hunting or four-wheeling um Mm -hmm. even bicycle riding like i've known people that have attempted to bicycle ride in a skirt were those just all <laughs> off? <laughs> were those just all off limits, or did you do it with these strict dress guidelines? I wouldn't say anything was off limits. Um, mostly, I avoided a lot of activities because of my own embarrassment and false okay. shame that I put upon myself. So, I had what were considered modest swimsuits, but even then, I still felt very ashamed of my body. And so I really didn't feel, unless it was like just with a couple of girls, I really didn't feel comfortable swimming. So I, the majority of my late teenage years and my early twenties, I didn't really swim at all. Um, if we were to go to some event where they'd be swimming, like a large family get together or even a church activity or something, I would sit out. I would just maybe soak my legs in the pool water while okay. hiking up my skirt a little bit. <laughs> so I didn't really not do past that. The knee, right? Not, not past the knee. Um, um, I did horseback ride a little bit and, uh, prior to being diagnosed, I did do some horseback riding lessons for a couple of years and I did sure. get one pair of jeans for that, but they were very loose and okay. bulky. They were kind of like a male cut. Cause again, sure. we can't have anything that accentuates your figure. So I had some very ill-fitting jeans that I used for horseback riding lessons. But then after that, in to horseback ride occasionally, I wore a, a homemade riding skirt that came down to my ankles. Oh, so something okay. that women in like the early 1900s would have worn. So it looks when you're not on the horse, it looks like a full circle skirt. Is it really poofy? So you can like super wide, 
super wide. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like a circle skirt, but it is actually two pant legs. Oh, so when you're okay. sitting on the horse, it still kind of looks like you're wearing a skirt, but this almost way, like a culotte, but yeah. Even, okay. But it was down to your ankles. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I would sure. wear that for riding and any other kind of activity. I just avoided. I did go ice skating a couple times in a skirt. Okay. And that hurt when I fell on the ice and my bare oh. legs were touching me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure everyone thought I was crazy. At yeah. The <laughs> yeah. So switching gears a little bit, um, you know, we learned about, I think the religious philosophy that drove this movement. Um, do you believe there's any scriptural basis that a woman is under her father's authority until marriage? No. Sure. Um, would you consider, I know some people, you know, this has really affected their faith in, in God, or they've just kind of steered away from all of it. Would you still consider yourself a Christian or how did this affect your faith? You know, now that you've done therapy and left the movement, where are you today? Yeah, I uh, would definitely consider myself a Christian and passionately follow and have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but I deconstructed from religion and deconstructed fully from fundamentalism and patriarchal Christianity. And um, instead um, I had to relearn how to read scripture and I'm still learning that. Sure. There's still some books of the Bible I still won't open because they're too triggering and they're too difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but it, uh, I'm still working on relearning passages of scripture that had been twisted and used as a weapon against me growing up. Right. So I'm relearning those. Um, the thing that I have found most helpful is to study the character of Jesus and actually learn the heart of God and realize and take that as your bird's eye view and filter the rest of scripture through the heart of God. Mm -hmm. um, because it's very easy to take for instance, a verse that Paul may have written um, to one specific church in one specific time and era with specific mm -hmm. customs, you know, right. and suddenly want to apply that to everything. Whereas it actually contradicts the heart of God as a, as a whole, you know, I'm specifically thinking about things regarding, you know, maybe women being, women not having a position in church I know some people want to take some of Paul's writings and say that women are supposed to be silent at church, mm -hmm. but look what Jesus did. He had women alongside him through discipleship and he right. uplifted women and he gave them equal standing and respect as the men. He broke the cultural norms so much throughout his three-year ministry. And so I prefer to look at scripture through the lens of the heart of Jesus and how he actually practiced his ministry on earth, rather than looking through um, just some of the cultural references that we see in um, both Old and New Testament. Right. Um, where would you see the movement now? Like, obviously, is, is Bill Gothard and the ATI still like something people are following, would you say, or, and They're, then the movement as a whole, where is the movement as, you, you know, the ideology? Cause I know some of the people have come and gone that were big promoters of it in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. It's definitely taken a hit over the last mm -hmm. couple of decades for sure. Um, I think the digital age has really helped that because prior to the internet, prior to social media, um, you just didn't have the access. I mean, like I, like I said, with my own deconstruction journey, it started because I found a website right. that had stories written by survivors. And then I became involved in some Facebook groups mm -hmm. um, with survivors in it. And so if I hadn't had the internet, you know, I'm not sure how I would have gotten the truth to me. Um, so I think the digital age has really hindered um, the progression of the movement. Um, there's also been plenty of scandals uh, that have been brought wide open, thank goodness. So Doug Phillips is no longer head of Vision Form. I actually don't even think Vision Form is a company anymore. Um, and um, Bill Gothard is no longer the head of ATI. 
after the lawsuit. Um, so <laughs> a lot of these um, patriarchs of the movement and the, the big, big name teachers and proponents of the movement have all been exposed as sexual predators for the most part. And I think that's really opened the eyes to the followers to realize that maybe this is not the kind of person we should be receiving instruction from, you know? Um, and I know it was most popular in the eighties and nineties and all those kids that grew up in it now are now adults and they realize the harm that it did and they are choosing not to continue that education with their own children. Mm -hmm. Sure. So what would you say to somebody that's either still in the movement or considering joining the movement? Hmm. Well, if I could talk to somebody who's considering joining it, I would certainly discuss the dangers that are in it and a bit about my own story and how harmful some of these beliefs can be. But someone who's in it, they have to become at the right place of mind that they're willing to accept um, an outside voice. Because I know if I had come across that website that I discussed before, I know if I had come across it just a year prior, I would have scoffed and would have said, those are just bitter people and they're not real Christians and their theology is all messed up. So I had to be at the right place and time for me to be willing to accept an outside voice. And there's a lot of different things that can prepare someone to be willing. Sometimes it can take years. Sometimes it can be just one traumatizing event that makes them want to search out outside voices. Um, but when, unless someone's ready to really listen and hear anything you share is they're going to scoff at it. And they're going to think that you're just not really a Christian. You don't really love God or else you would be doing what they think the Bible says you should do. <laughs> right. Right. Good. Okay. Anything else that I didn't talk about or angles that I didn't hit on that you would like to share? Um, looking through the list here. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Was there anything you enjoyed about it that you were, you know, you mentioned, cause you and your mom were both very much like gung ho. Yes. Was there anything looking back where you're like, this was kind of cool. I would say the allure of the movement is it's supposed stability. And the vending machine gospel of put good in, get good out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and right. because we're told everything is definitive that if you follow these rules, these blessings will happen. If you stay a virgin until marriage, then you're going to have an amazing sex life in marriage. Mm -hmm. If you stay under the protection of your father. You're never going to get physically assaulted out and about in public, that sort of thing. Um, and so there's a lot of false security in that where you think that you're going to be protected from certain bad things happening to you if you follow all the rules. And that's very alluring um, because we want, I think as humans living in a very broken world, we crave control and we crave mm -hmm. stability and we want to prevent bad things from happening. Um, but you have to come to a realization as you begin deconstructing from the movement, you have to realize that it is the ultimate lie and that there's nothing that you can do to control um, how your life is going to turn out in, in these specific you know, areas. You could go through the courtship movement, you could follow all the rules and still be stuck in an abusive marriage. You know, mm -hmm. There's just no way to control certain things like that. Um, so now as someone who's out of it, I would say I still sometimes miss the false security. Sure. I, I wish I could control things, but I can't. <laughs> Um, and I really miss the close community 
I've, I've rebuilt my community for mm-hmm. sure. But, you know, one of the difficult things about being an adult is learning to have relationship with somebody who doesn't believe the exact same way that you do. And that right. can be hard sometimes because you have disagreements and sometimes relationships fall away and friendships fall away. And when you're raised in a cult or such an extremely bonded bubble community, everybody thinks the same. So sometimes there can be very little co- conflict, you know, as long as you're all agreeing with each right. other. Now, a lot of times these families hid dark secrets with, with abuse. I'm not saying these families were very happy, but as far as just like belief wise, there really wasn't very much conflict because you were all cookie cutters. You all believed the exact same thing. Yeah. That's interesting. I spoke to another lady and she said almost the same thing. She said she missed going to I don't even remember if it was ATI conferences or a different kind, basically going and knowing that everyone there was so much in agreement with you that you really did feel like you had just all of these people around you in this sense of community. And she's like, I really missed that part of it, Yes, um, which was and it felt kind of interesting. Safe, you right. know, it felt safe. I, the ATI conferences were the highlight of my year because it was the one time a year I could go to some place and not be afraid of the world, right. worldly people, because mm-hmm. I went somewhere and everybody looked like me and everyone acted like me and talked like yeah. me and believed the same thing I did. And there was like, oh, I'm safe. This is my right. people. Right. <laughs> this is my tribe, my community <laughs> oh, versus the big scary world. You go out to the grocery store and there's people wearing pants, you know? <laughs> right. Oh yes. I know. <laughs> Uh, okay. Thank you so much, Emily. This was really cool to talk to you. Um, I so appreciate it. I know you're a busy lady because I follow you online and always got lots going on. <laughs> a bit. It can be chaotic, but yes. I love, love the work that I do. And um, where can people find you? On um, my main ministry is called Thriving Forward. Um, and um, my husband is a graphic designer and he's currently redesigning my website. But um, hopefully it'll be up and running soon. But in the meantime, you can follow me on Facebook at Thriving Forward. And um, I write, um, you'll be able to see, because I write under my name, Emily Elizabeth Anderson. And I talk about current events that are happening um, uh, within the church and uh, write pretty regularly on the dangers of the patriarchal movement and what deconstructing is like. And do I best to try to advocate for survivors that are either still in or coming out of the movement. Sounds good. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. Thank you. It's been wonderful.